Support for I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere comes from MX Publishing, with the largest catalog of new Sherlock Holmes books in the world. New novels, biographies, graphic novels, and short story collections about Sherlock Holmes. Find them at mxpublishing.com. And by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. And from listeners like you, who support us through Patreon. Bonus material, thank you gifts, and more await at patreon.com slash I Hear of Sherlock. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 246, Sherlock Holmes and the British Empire. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became astronomer. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. <laughs> The game's afoot as we discuss goings-on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger streeter regulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Well, hello there, and welcome once again to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. I hear um, a a sort of a high-pitched whistling when you speak, and I... It doesn't bother me, but if it's in the recording, it Ah. sounds sounds like you're hearing aids. You know what? They might have been... uh, bunched together there near the microphone. All right, let's uh, let's start this over then. Yeah, I think maybe. Yeah, because I okay. hear. Mm. Do you hear it now? No. Okay. You have good ears. <laughs> what? Huh? <laughs> All right. Huh. Well, hello there, and welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast where... Wah, wah, wah. Well, hello there, and welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, you are back from traveling, not around the world in 80 days, but around the Northeast a little bit. Yes, I've parked my gas balloon and (laughs) uh, my steamship out in the driveway, and boy, oh boy, the kids from the neighborhood are just gathering around, eating popcorn, wondering when it's all going to deflate. Yeah, No, but I'm back from uh, a terrific experience at the Baker Street Irregulars British Empire Conference, which we're going to be talking about with our listeners today. Yeah, and this is going to be fascinating, not only for them, but for me, too, because I actually did not attend this conference, so I'm really interested in hearing what some of the speakers had to say and the uh the program and we will have uh, a copy of the program notes the program agenda as part of our uh, uh show notes here the program just looked chock full of so many different and so many interesting uh, talks about life in the British Empire during Sherlock Holmes's time. So should be fascinating to hear. If you'd like those show notes, you can find them at ihose.co slash ihose246 using all lowercase. That'll get you to the ihearofsherlock.com website specifically to this entry. You can also look in the notes section of whichever podcast app you use to listen to us and make sure you're subscribed to us so you are not missing any of the updates. As long as you're being notified when we come out, uh, that'll remind you that on the 15th and 30th of every month, there is a new episode available. And if you want a surefire way 
of finding out and of getting even more information and content from us, check us out on Patreon. For as little as $1 a month, your support helps us actually do the show and all of the bells and whistles that go in behind it, but it also gives you an opportunity to get that extra content and to be notified of it. So that is in the show notes as well, our Patreon link, or just go to patreon.com slash I hear of Sherlock. Well, Bert, this is uh, the part of the show where we typically do a biography of our guest, but I'm not going to do your biography since we all know you really well. But I'm going to turn it over to you to take us to Bear Mountain and talk about what it is that you found yourself in the midst of a few weeks ago. I found myself in the midst of one of the Baker Street Irregulars quadrennial conferences. And this was a theme that Mike Keene, Michael Keene Wiggins of the Baker Street Irregulars came to when he kicked off the conference roughly every four years or so. The Baker Street Irregulars have a major conference like this. That's an initiative that our much-missed Mike Whalen uh, brought to the organization some years ago. And Mike pointed out, and Ross Davies, who's the organizer for this conference, also pointed out that the idea for this conference began with Mike Whalen, but it was postponed multiple times because of the pandemic, of course. So the conference began with a heartfelt thanks to Mike. And indeed, Mike's presence was really felt, I think, during the entire weekend. But Mary Ann Bradley was there, and Mike's wife, and it was just wonderful to see her there and to talk with her and to realize that all the work that she and Mike had been part of over the years had finally come through in the conference. Well, that's lovely to hear. I know they were such a a great uh, team together, and we talked a little bit about uh, Mike's legacy Uh, back at the end of 2021 when we did uh, that tribute show to him. So we'll have a link to that episode in the show notes as well if people would like to hear about Mike Whalen's larger impact. So uh, this was it, this was effectively a uh, a, a two day program agenda, but it really uh, it, it it happened over the course of three days, probably from Friday evening until Sunday afternoon. Um, what was it like there? What was the the atmosphere uh, like? Where was it held? It was held at the Bear Mountain Inn, which is a conference center. I I suppose you could call it in upstate New York. It's not really all that upstate, but it is uh, on, you know, on the Hudson, basically quite near the Hudson and um, near West Point. And it was a lovely old stone manor that is not really a manor. It's a building, a structure, an inn, a conference, now a conference center that was put up in the early part of the 20th century and was used for some time by scouts for meetings and conventions and campouts and so on, and is now quite an elaborate public park. So it's really quite enormous, but it's uh, in the woods, and it's a beautiful old stone structure with very, very attentive staff. That sounds lovely. Sounds lovely. Yeah. So, so take us through the uh, the event what, and and how things kind of rolled out. And I know you have some sound clips that you uh, brought along with you because you talked to some of the. Uh, presenters throughout the day. Yeah, and our intent, you know, today on this show is really to do two things. Really, one is present a little souvenir of the conference and also to give our listeners uh, a view of what the discussions were all about and and what they might have missed in the conference. But the good news is that the papers are going to be brought together and published, you know, not immediately, but I imagine in a year or so will be available Uh, for anybody to buy to dig into these materials uh, in more detail. But also you can reach out to some of the speakers that we're going to talk about. It was a great program. It kicked off with an intro, as I said, from Michael Keane and from Ross Davies, the organizer, and began immediately with Mike Burdan, our friend Marshall S. Burdan, and a talk on the British Empire. And Mike touched on 
um, a number of topics. And in these sound clips, I'm not going to be presenting the talks or the presentations these people gave. Rather, I talked for a few minutes with some of the speakers, with many of the speakers after their talks. But Mike covered really the expansion of the empire, the annexations and the growth um, the great game, you know, which we have talked about in the past, Britain's conflicts with Russia and other European powers jockeying for position as the empire expanded in Europe and in Asia. Mike talked about his impressions of the empire, which was frequently referred to the empire upon which the sun never sets, and uh, talked about that quite uh, compellingly. Colonialism, you know, today, of course, we're much more aware of the negative colonial aspects of the British Empire as it really ran roughshod over um, many of the countries that became wrapped into that umbrella. And along the way, Mike corrected some of Arthur Conan Doyle's misperceptions, which I talked to him for a second about. You know, for example, his book, The War in South Africa, Its Causes, which resulted in Sir Arthur's knighting, uh, I think it, Mike described it quite well as, as jingoistic and factually challenged, <laughs> which I thought was very accurate. And of course, the empire, you know, he put a great perspective on the empire, because after all, 1897 was Queen Victoria's golden jubilee, 60 years on the throne. But about 20 years later, 20, 30 years later, the glorious empire, the empire that had been a, a factor for multiple centuries, you know, it was pretty much all gone. So let's uh, hear just a few minutes of uh, my conversation after Mike's presentation with Mike Burdan. Uh, I am Mike Burdan, formerly known as Marshall S., and I am a semi-retired freelance travel writer. I lived myself in Hong Kong for three years, so I did get to see this kind of empire at work. Um, this was the last days of Hong Kong, but you know I did live in the Empire, and it was an experience to see how the British were um, kind of palming it off as a glorious experience. <laughs> it peaked geographically after World War I when they got the German territories and the Ottoman Empire, but they could never really hold on to it after that because the war had so devastated the English economy and the military. But, uh, yeah, it all ended pretty quickly. Unraveled, I guess, is the best term for it. I got started real early this time because Rost got on me well in advance um, and just started finding out all the things that one could say about the British Empire and then realizing I could probably only say about a tenth of them and choosing the ones that seemed like they would be most well received by this audience. Things they didn't know and uh, things that were very succinct and maybe I could squeeze in a pun or two. I had always suspected that it was not quite the glorious affair that Holmes, Watson, and Doyle would have us believe. And yes, I was able to unearth a lot of the atrocities, the concentration camps in South Africa, for example, that uh, you know, they kept pretty well under wraps, but that modern historians have thrown open for us. And interestingly enough, you mentioned also Conan Doyle's book for which he was knighted, you know, the yes. war and Africa and so on. Yeah. And well, you described it as jingoistic and factually challenged. Yes. Well, first of all, he wrote it after he had left South Africa. He left in, I believe, July of 1990, and most of the atrocities occurred afterwards. So he did not know whereof he wrote. He was just going with the standard, you know, government reports, no, no, there's nothing to see here, move on. You know, there was a public relations campaign that hid the atrocities and hid the ugly side of making the sausage. You know, they were just concerned about bringing the riches back to England. But indeed, there was lots to see there, and it was eventually revealed to be these things did happen. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, factually challenged. Yeah, you know, I suppose... When we romanticize the British Empire of those of those years, um, it was just grand as long as you were white and in charge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's very fair. It's a good summary. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, and uh, you know, I, I, that, that's the wonderful thing about uh, studying history is that we peel back more layers, we find out more uh, more things that are closer to the truth over time, and it may not necessarily reflect well upon the subjects that we had uh, at one time. Uh, kind of unceremoniously, uh, simply celebrated, simply because they were the victors. They, they they say the victors get to write history, and I guess this is the uh, perfect example of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can tell uh, in that clip with Mike that I cut out a lot of my questions because I thought, you know, our listeners are really interested in hearing about hearing from the speakers, not me posing a bunch of questions. But I had to put in there the phrasing for that question about. Uh, Sir Arthur's book. I thought that it was just fascinating. It was a great talk. And Mike was the first speaker to kick off the conference, and he was perfectly on time. And so when I stepped up, I was the second speaker. I had exactly that same challenge to meet. And I gave a talk following Mike on the canonical empire, the British Empire as it manifests itself in the canon. And what I talked about really were was in sort of three phases. The, the first phase was Holmes, Watson, and the Empire. What were their personal experiences of the Empire? And I reviewed some of the cases that uh, Holmes came across that were characteristic of the Empire and resulted in problems and issues that Sherlock Holmes had to deal with. But the real fun that I had in that part of the talk was to talk a little bit about the great hiatus because the idea that he went uh, that his that his travels during the great hiatus as he explained them to Watson was really all that there was doesn't really ring true and over the years so many people have wondered about that what was he really doing and so I retraced his route um, and came to the conclusion that he may have left a clue in that route and from, from all that, which was a highly sort of visual part of my talk, I came to the conclusion that what he was really doing was advising Mycroft and the British government about Russia leading down to the great game, around, all around the importance of Tibet. And from there, I talked about Watson and my wand, along with the other cases in the empire that really influenced Watson, and then went on to some characteristics of the empire, the wealth of the empire and how that colored cases that Holmes had to deal with, the evil from the empire in the form of the great villains whose habits and actions connected with the life of Sherlock Holmes is when they came back to England, the death and disease that Holmes encountered that had its origins in the empire. And then the redemptive character of the empire. You know, we have characters in the Sherlock Holmes canon like Gilchrist in The Three Students who go off to South Africa, off to Rhodesia, and characters who come back too, who, who um, have matured, whose character's been improved by their experience in the empire. And then I closed with a bit of a mystery which was all around 1897 and the Queen's golden jubilee and Sherlock Holmes' potential involvement in all of that. So I had a, a, a grand time with, you know, that that uh, part of the program. And I finished on time. I was just going to ask you that. That's an awful lot to cover in just 30 minutes. And, um, you know, it actually gives me an idea for a potential three-part uh, episode series on trifles where we can dig apart uh, pick apart some of these things and uh, dig a little deeper with you. Oh, that's fun. Well, that would be a, that would be a lot of fun. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And, and then I was followed on the program by Mike McSwiggan. And Mike, <laughs> Mike gave a talk with a terrific title that I have to read because I can never pronounce it or remember it. Our Sherlockian Psionical Societal Commonwealth. <laughs> <laughs> That's easy and, for you to say. Yeah, and what he really <laughs> talked about was the birth of Sherlock Holmes' societies, groups, fandom around the world, around the empire. He reviewed, uh, you know, he said at the outset, look, I'm not going to talk about America and I'm not going to talk about England. But he did talk about Canada. He talked about the first Sherlock Holmes society that he could find trace of in Europe talked a little bit about France, told some very interesting um, 
stories about Sherlock Holmes' enthusiasm in places in Eastern Europe under communist influence where they ran into obstacles, which I had never realized happened because uh, of uh, government reluctance to have people talking openly about imperial and things and so on. And my first question to Mike was, who was first uh, among all of the people around the world who were interested in Sherlock Holmes to set up a society outside of America and um, England? really looks likely that the Germans were first out of the gate with a Sherlockian group, although that's long gone. I didn't realize they were first. I'm Mike McSwiggin. Uh, in boring normal life, I'm a pharmacist, but in much more fun Sherlockian life, uh, I edit the chapter of Sherlockian societies for the Baker Street Almanac, and also, along with Stephen Rusty Mason, uh, put together the uh, Sherl Sherlockian Society world map for the Beacon Society. The talk was originally going to be Mike Whalen and myself, and it was going to actually be a little bit different. It was, it started out as how not so much the groups, but just sure. Sherlock Holmes took hold in each country. And then with his passing, uh, uh, Marianne, uh, his widow, came on board, and we kind of shifted it more to really the groups themselves. And since she knows everyone in the Sherlockian world and has been to many of these countries, she was able to reach out with her amazing Rolodex and help get us lots of great info. I, I made some contacts too, thanks to the indexes that I maintain. Uh, I know a few too, but these are all places I haven't been to. And then also there are great books put out by the BSI, uh, put out by uh, the Germans and a few other groups. There's some good books on uh, France and uh, Japan and I got that all together. And then when I felt like something was missing, I just reach out. and. Not surprisingly, Sherlockians like to talk about Sherlockians, so I can usually get good info. Really looks likely that the Germans were first out of the gate with a Sherlockian group, although that's long gone. I didn't realize they were first, and the Australians were also, although it wasn't so much a society as a group of miners who liked to take an interesting photograph of the uh, Dancing Men Code, but that they were very early. Um, I think what surprised me, just because I hadn't thought about it, was the effect communism had on the hobby and essentially ceased it in especially the Eastern Bloc countries uh, like the Czech Republic and Hungary and how they had to take a pause. Similarly in Italy, um, how Mussolini had, had a very similar effect and while he was in charge there was a little Sherlock Holmes on the radio and oddly in comic books. That was okay, but you could not publish uh, a Sherlock Holmes story. And I just had never thought about it from that perspective. So it was really enlightening for me. Yeah. Learn something new every day, I guess. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that interesting? It is. It is. Mm. Yeah. Really, when I, really... I, I had heard somewhere about the German uh, Sherlockian society being first, but I had squirreled it away because you know it was one of those flash in the pan moments that uh, it didn't it didn't quite stick the way some of the others did. Yeah, and it's interesting too because you know it has to happen in translation. Now, of course, the, there was a lot of right. piracy, and Conan Doyle is, was on record as fuming about the piracy of his work in in Germany. But <laughs> somebody's got to pirate it, somebody's got to translate it, and and off you go. Yeah. yeah. Mike Mike was Mike McSwiggin was followed on the program by a fascinating talk. The title of which was. Uh, the Sun Never Set on Sherlock, Publishing the Canon Around the Empire. And that was by Erica Dowell. And Erica talked really about two things. One was the logistics of printing and publishing and distribution in the British Empire and around those days, which I found fascinating. And then she discussed syndication, you know, pointing out, for example, that in Christchurch, New Zealand, um, newspapers began running the cases of Sherlock Holmes, and we don't know to what degree that those appearances were official or 
pirated. But she pointed out things, you know, for example, like on the east coast of Australia, scandal in Bohemia appeared with illustrations. You know, so it doesn't have the appearance of being pirated in three separate newspapers all about the same time. And and Erica was followed by Ashley Polisek, whose topic was uh, Sherlock Holmes on stage across the British Empire. And Ashley began by announcing that she was um, not going to talk about her topic. (laughs) (laughs) So here's the topic, and let me explain why I'm not going to talk about it. But what she did talk about was really, uh, was obviously related and obviously really brilliant. Uh, She talked about, again, the great hiatus. You know, if Holmes is traveling around in that time across the British Empire, um, in close contact with and, and traveling close to and in some cases in places like India and Egypt and Gibraltar, could he have earned some of the money he needed to keep traveling and maintained his anonymity by becoming an actor in some of those countries? And so she therefore discussed how emotions are communicated to audiences in those disparate places and how reactions and responses are then communicated. And she began with India and she talked a little bit about the, the government control of the theater. For example, it was, it was not possible in India. I didn't think about this, but it makes perfect sense. Um, to put on stage productions that would be a protest against colonial rule. Then she turned to Egypt, and she had some fascinating things to say about opera in Egypt. Then she talked also about Gibraltar. So I had a fun time after uh, her presentation just sort of talking with her about her research and what she thought about all of this and what she's currently doing in the theater. I'm Ashley Polisek, and I do so many things, it's hard to describe. But right now, I work as the executive director of the Ken Ludwig Company, which more or less means that as far as Ken, the playwright, is concerned, I do everything for him but write the plays. I came to this uh, cold. I came to this topic cold. So I originally started to write a paper that was more traditionally in the lines of what I usually do, which is looking at adaptations of Sherlock Holmes. And I got 800 words into that paper and realized I couldn't actually make it exist the way I wanted to. And so I scrapped it and started from scratch with the idea that rather than looking at Sherlock Holmes on stage, the plays, I would look at Sherlock Holmes on stage the person uh, with the hypothesis that during the great hiatus he uh, made some extra pocket money by working as an itinerant actor but that he would have to integrate himself into the theatrical structures and conventions of each of the countries that he visited. So uh, number one was in India which uh, I looked at a little bit Uh, from the perspective of what vocabulary he would have to learn, the way that our vocabulary in sort of European dramatics originates in a large way from Aristotle's poetics. Uh, So Holmes would have had to learn other styles of acting that originate from different concepts and conventions of theater. Uh, And also the joy of thinking about the dancing that he would be required to do, which is essential to Indian drama. And then moving into Egypt, uh, Egypt became such a hybridized culture in terms of its arts, particularly around the time in the decades after the opening of the Suez Canal uh, in 1869. So there, uh, the hybrid style was uh, operetta, where the uh, European dramatic style that he wanted, he would have brought in as an actor, was made acceptable to the locals by incorporating local music and so dancing in India, singing in Egypt and then through Gibraltar which had been a long time British colony, much longer, uh, 1713. Uh, There it was hampered in terms of the arts by lack of space, it's four square miles. So what he would have been doing there is uh, street performance and their style of performance there that was very popular right at the end of the 19th century was Zarzuela, which included not singing and dancing only, but also comedy. 
I had to learn all of it from scratch, just the way he would have had to, which kind of made me happy. Uh, and it, it mirrors in some ways the career that I'm moving into now, which is I've entered into a sector I don't understand at all. and. For some strange reason, I've been plopped in at the very top level of it, and I just have to figure it out. So uh, I'll give you an example. I've been working on uh, an opera for a really, really good opera company in uh, in New York, in Cooperstown. It just premiered a week and a half ago, and I don't know anything about opera. And now I have to sit in here and be in charge of managing the script that's going to be used by the maestro. Meanwhile, I can't even follow the score because all the lyrics are in Italian because it's all Rossini music. And then all, even though I can read music, it's all bel canto. So it's even following the, the scores. So I have kind of no idea what I'm doing and flying by the seat of my pants, which is what Holmes would have had to do. So that is how I approached my research. Well, we wish you great luck in, in uh in the future and can't wait for the opera. Thank you. I'll be at the Met waiting for the debut. I hope it gets there. That'd be brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> well. Yeah. Now, the opera, I talked to her a little bit more about that afterwards. The opera turns out to be a new opera by Ken Ludwig, which debuted in July at the Glimmerglass Festival. Hmm. So, and, it, and it's called Tenor Overboard. <laughs> now, of course, you know, Ken is a Tony Award winning, Olivier Award winning playwright who won an award early on in his career for Lend Me a Tenor. Lend Me and a so Tenor, this, yeah. yeah. And so this opera is called Tenor Overboard, and it uses the music of Rossini. Doesn't that sound like that? I like the tenor of that, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. Well, we're going to pause now for a short station break. Uh, stick with us, and we'll get back to talking to our interviewees just after this quick word. The MX Book of New Sherlock Holmes Stories is the world's largest collection of new traditional Sherlock Holmes stories with all author royalties going to the Undershaw School for Children with Learning Disabilities. And as of the end of June 2022, these authors have raised over $100,000 for Undershaw. That donation, which continues to rise, has been gifted from the royalties of all of the stories coming from the MX book of New Sherlock Holmes stories. The deep partnership between Undershaw and MX Publishing has spanned a number of years and has witnessed many changes. Undershaw, of course, was the house built for Arthur Conan Doyle in order to accommodate his wife's health requirements and it's where he lived from, with his family from 1897 to 1907. While he was there, he would have worked on The Return of Sherlock Holmes and The Hound of the Baskervilles. And that continues now with the MX book of new Sherlock Holmes stories, now up to part 23, under the capable editorial guide of David Markham. Congratulations to our friends at MX Publishing on reaching the $100,000 mark in their support of Undershaw. As you continue to show interest in the MX book of new Sherlock Holmes stories, MX Publishing will continue to be able to support Undershaw and all that it offers, those beacons of the future. Check out the MX book of new Sherlock Holmes stories at mxpublishing.com. All right, we are back, and we're ready to transplant ourselves once again at Bear Mountain. <laughs> well, we had a great talk following Ashley's by Julia Carson Rosenblatt. And, of course, Julia uh, has such a long experience in the cuisine of Sherlock Holmes. And, and Julia and her husband, Al, and, of course, and Fritz Sonnenschmidt at the Culinary Institute of America put on uh, a whole series of wonderful dinners over the years. Um, on Sherlock Holmes themes and at varying points. And Julie is, of course, the author of Dining with Sherlock Holmes, many other papers about cuisine in uh, Holmes's day. And her talk was entitled Canonical Taste of the Empire. And there were a couple of really fast, well, there's a lot of fascinating things in Julia's talk. One, she talked about the British use of spices. And even as the spice trade succeeded, 
and more spices were brought into English cuisine. Apparently, the British use of spices declined. Salt and pepper became staple spices rather than rare. And she pointed out that curry came into cuisine from the came into British cuisine, but it also came into the empire not because it was an essential part of Indian cuisine at all. She said curry is a homogenization by the British, which uh, I thought was was just fascinating. Hmm. I had no idea. But I, yeah. I did know that uh, some of the best Indian cuisine in the world is available in London. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, how much of that is uh, really authentic Indian cuisine or sort of more homogenized Indian cuisine. Yeah. Uh, anyway, and I, I note that uh, Julia's presentation was appropriately slotted just before lunch. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And lunch was very good, but it didn't quite live up, I don't think, to Julia's uh, presentation. Uh, but it was really satisfying nonetheless. After lunch, we had a fascinating talk by someone new to the Sherlockian sphere, David Allen Richards. And he spoke on Kipling. Doyle, the canon, and empire. And I will leave David to introduce, you know, himself in the audio clip, but I will just point out that he talked with us about how Conan Doyle and Kipling connected. You know, it turns out they both shared A.P. Watt as an agent, which I never knew. And of course, um, Conan Doyle thought very highly of Kipling, called him a master. They were both members of the Athenaeum Club. They were both reporters of a sort in South Africa, writing about their experiences there. Both Kipling and Conan Doyle lost sons in World War I. And as David told us, spiritualism was a very sore point in their relationship because Kipling loathed it. It really caused a rift. Kipling apparently felt that it had turned his sister's mind, and his sister uh, was never the same because of the influences and of spiritualism. And David also talked about Kipling as a detective story writer, and I'd forgotten that, that he'd written a series of stories about a detective character named uh, Strickland. And he gave us a profile about um, Kipling. He said Kipling was the most successful author in the world around 1900. And uh, he told us a little bit about how that came to be. So let's, let's hear an introduction um, from um, David Allen Richard, who was a, a very welcome guest at Bear Mountain. Uh, I'm Dave Richards. Uh, I'm a retired Manhattan real estate lawyer, uh, but I'm also the largest Kipling collector in the world. My collection is now at the Beinecke Rare Book Library, and uh, I published in 2010 an 800-page bibliography of Rudyard Kipling with the British Library. And so I've written a lot about Kipling and his books, and when Ross asked me to do a comparison for uh, our, our Sherlock Holmes and Empire conference, I had enough background, plus I'd done a paper for the first version of this conference four years ago, which Ross would let me use, but which I published in the Kipling Journal, which talked about the White Company and the reunion of the British Empire. So I've become very interested in Doyle, and I'm also very close friends, I had dinner with him three weeks ago, with Andrew Lysett, who wrote the biography of Kipling and of Doyle, and I sent him a photograph of our conference bag because he wrote me two mornings ago saying, I wish I was going to be with you. Kipling had a remarkable gene pool. His father worked at the Victorian Albert Museum in South Kensington and was sent out to India to teach ceramics to the natives so that there would be imports coming back. His mother was one of four sisters, McDonald sisters, Scots, one married Edward Byrne Jones, one married Sir Adam Pointer, one married an industrialist named Baldwin, and her son, their son, was the Prime Minister of England. Uh, and so uh, they were an artistic family. And the second book that they wrote together was called Quartet, 
and Kipling did poems, his sister did poems, they all contributed something. So the notion of writing, of making stories up, uh, and then, of course, he's not, don't have enough money to send him to Oxbridge, so he ends up going back out, age 17, number two on a two-man newspaper in Allahabad, and they can't fill the columns, so he starts doing anonymous things, which later published called turnovers, because you had to turn over the page in order to read them, and he does these stories, and uh, we haven't talked in this conference about the Indian railway system. We haven't talked. We have talked about Indian publications, and the uh, W. H. Smith of uh, 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 whose name was Wheeler ran the Indian peri- Indian railroad station periodicals, and he came to Kipling and he said. Can we do paperbacks of your stories? And from that we get Soldiers 3, We Willy Winky in black and white. They cost one rupee. People read them. They <laughs> leave them on the train. The train cars go all over England and he becomes, or all over India, and he becomes famous because people are picking up his old rupee paperbacks. And then he sells the copyright, the departmental ditties, to go to the big town. Uh, Yale has the check that he was paid in rupees for that copyright. He bought it back later. And he goes off to England and starts writing there, uh, both poems and short stories. But, uh, but he and Doyle were both fortunate to be alive and writing when magazines were in a golden thing. And they could make their money writing a story, put it in a serial, put it between hard covers, and sell it, you know, twice or more. So, and, and Doyle, to his, as I have learned, aggravation and he has to bring him back from the falls but he creates an iconic uh, greater than James Bond more interesting than James Bond not a cad Bond is a cad uh, but uh, a, a fabulous writer learning uh, maybe the love of stories from his mother the uh, method from Dr. Bell I gather and uh, a very clever and and someone who was a, a much a committed imperialist as Rudyard was both very overage, and they go out to the Boer War, and Doyle's a doctor, and they're, they overlap on the British War newspaper, and they're reporters, and they were in the service of their country yeah. and their empire. Absolutely. Wow. <laughs> Lovely parallel. Yeah, isn't that interesting? And then, of course, you know, Dave is so deeply connected to Kipling and is such an authority and is a figure, obviously, yeah, major figure in the Kipling Society. I had to ask him, so how does the Kipling Society compare or intersect with the Baker Street Irregulars that you've now <laughs> seen? And here's what he had to say about that. Well, there, uh, there will be a footnote in the paper when this is published. They met in 1965, the only recorded meeting of the two societies, and I think they probably found one another a little strange. The the Kipling Society is used to be, not so much anymore, more hag- uh, hagiography, uh, hagi, uh, the, the, the all in praise of, of Kipling. Uh, but it's got a wonderful website. Uh, they hold an annual meeting. They've got about 700 members uh, internationally. And they publish a very solid, um, not in the variety, there's only one Kipling journal. It's not like the BSI Journal and the, and the others, and let alone all the little clubs, the Scion clubs that I've learned about in this, in this uh, conference. But, uh, and we uh, probably have more of a problem with getting younger members in than you folks do, but I even saw in one of the brochures over there that I picked up trying to get young people interested in Sherlock Holmes. So we have that sort of same problem, but... Uh, and Kipling, of course, had, had the movies, uh, uh, The Man Who Would Be King, most famously John Huston. But you've got all these series and uh, over the years, uh, Jeremy Brett, um, and um, most recently, the Benedict Cumberbatch, which are absolutely brilliant. Yeah. So you may last longer than us, I don't know. No, but it, no. but it's, it's a very exciting to see how much activity and interest there is. It's just wonderful. Yeah, you know that's a that's an interesting observation. I mean, uh, Kipling was uh, at the top of the world uh, about 120 years ago. Uh, you know, most successful writer, and here uh, Conan Doyle eclipsed him not only in his lifetime, um, but <laughs> continues to uh, to do so in the afterlife. Which would be, uh, I think, Conan Doyle as a spiritualist would get a great kick out of that. 
<laughs> yes, well, maybe he is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it was just, it was terrific to have somebody like Dave there. And we could talk with him, you know, for hours more. He's, he's a really interesting uh, part of the program. Dave was followed on the program by Mike Homer, who gave a fascinating story, uh, paper about the Indian backstory in the sign of four, you know, which he entitled, We Ask You to Be Rich. And he talked a little bit about Jonathan Small and his flight to Agra during the Sepoy mutinies. And he recounted uh, Small's story and added an enormous uh, amount of information and perspective and interest around um, the environment, the culture, that scene. You know, he really, really fleshed it out. And Mike was followed on the program by Peggy, Peggy Perdue, who gave us a canonical safari through British colonial Africa. And of course, her intent was to cover the entire continent. And she did. She did. But she talked, obviously, about so many of the, the great milestone moments that relate to Africa. For example, the Devil's Foot, uh, which has most, she said, of the in terms of a percentage, most of the references to Africa in the canon are found in one way or another in the Devil's Foot. Sterndale, of course, an archetype British character, an explorer. And she addressed very successfully some of Arthur Conan Doyle's comparative anatomy comments about uh, the various races in the canon, I thought diplomatically but firmly. And uh, it was just great fun to talk to Peggy. I'm Peggy Perdue, and I'm a librarian at the Toronto Public Library. You know, when you read these stories, there's a lot of little things that you sort of just skip over. And then when you sit down and write a paper and start doing some research, you're saying, wait a minute, that's not quite right, or, or oh my goodness, I think there might be a little bit of fiction in these stories. Um, <laughs> so, so yes, there were, there were a few things. It was, um, I enjoyed researching it very much, and, um, you know, I was certainly honored to uh, present it at the, the conference. You know, I, I wouldn't like to pick specifically on poor old Sir Arthur, but um, it, we do find that in the Victorian era, there really was um, a tendency to use comparative anatomy to, um, to support uh, specious uh, theories about um, race and class. And we did, uh, unfortunately, there is a little bit of that. There was some di uh, discussion uh, in Hound of the Baskervilles talking about the comparative anatomy of the Bushman and the Hottentot, two words which by the way we don't say anymore <laughs> you know we, we talk instead about um the san and the koi koi or the koi san but um and then as well uh there is a um there is one apparently indigenous african character in the uh, uh the blanche soldier who if you recall that one you uh, it's um he's described as as having a you know a huge bulbous head and uh, this 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 head, it, which reminded me a little bit of Tonga, who for some reason also have a, has a huge bulbous head. So there's there's really far too many people with huge bulbous heads. There's more, there's more than really we can account for through the facts. So uh, a bit of a mystery there. I mean, we're here for the mysteries, so that's all right. <laughs> Well, um, I did wine, I did some in the Arthur Conan Doyle collection, of course, at Toronto Public Library, but I also wound up using the uh, the, the reference library's uh, history section. I read a lot about um, colonialism. I, you know, you you always learn much more um, researching these um, presentations than you can ever pass on. Uh, it's um, and uh, and the one thing I really love about uh, Right, you know, writing or, or presenting Sherlockian topics is that there is literally nothing you can ever learn that you can't eventually put in a Sherlockian talk. <laughs> Boy, she's right about that. <laughs> All roads lead to Holmes. 
Well, that is that sort of takes us to the end of Saturday. We had a few more talks, and it wasn't possible really to talk to all of the speakers because we would have a program that was probably almost as long as the conference itself. But Hartley Nathan gave a terrific talk following Peggy about Canada and the canon. He reviewed the appearances of Canada in the canon. He pointed out that Conan Doyle was frequently called upon to advise on cases in Canada, which he consistently declined. But Hartley also made a great point. He said, you know, of the entire reach and scope of the empire, it's only Canada that has never provided a villain in the canon. (laughs) That's really interesting. I hadn't hadn't considered that before. Yeah, isn't that great? (laughs) And then Charlie Blankstein, our friend Charlie Blankstein, gave a terrific talk about Colonel Hater's gun room. You know, uh, Colonel Hater, of course, is uh, one of the people that we meet in the canon, and it is mentioned that he has a gun room, and Charlie talked about arms around the empire. Hmm. Colonel Hater being a fine old soldier. Um, he was Watson's patient, of course, in Afghanistan. And Charlie said, you know, anybody think about that? What was in his gun room? Well, in those days, you know, you'd have trophies and weapons from his family, his own weapons. And Charlie gave a fascinating talk, illustrated talk, reviewing the differences, for example, between an 1840 percussion cap pistol, which is something that Colonel Hader might have had, versus the Sikhs, you know, the the people that they were fighting against, uh, and the flintlocks they would have. And so it really was a technology story about British technology versus less advanced technology and talked a little bit about some of the weapons manufactured by the Colt Manufacturing Company, the six-shot 1851 barrel model, you know, which was really revolutionary. You know, when you got away from being needing to put um, a bullet into a gun, you know, one at a time with a rod and powder to a weapon that would allow you to shoot you know, multiple rounds very easily. Um, So without talking more about the contemporary relevance of that, I'll just say Charlie's talk was, uh, you know, really fascinating. And then... Well, you know, he he missed an opportunity there, Bert. Uh, Mm -hmm. He should have called his presentation uh, Haters Gonna Hate. (laughs) (laughs) Haters Gonna Hate. Oh, I like that. That's great. Well, that was followed by a great presentation by Ben and Sue Vizoski, who talked to us about whist. Of course, uh, Ron, poor old Ronald Day Dare is supposedly um, shot by Colonel Sebastian Moran. More about that in, in a few moments uh, because of cheating at a game of whist. But Charlie, uh, Susan and Ben explained that game to us. And afterwards, in the evening, many of us had an opportunity to sit down at a table with people from the conference, and play a game of whist, oh, which I had lovely. never done, which hmm. which was a lot of fun. And, of course, Ross had produced custom playing cards. Of course he did. Um, <laughs> you know, which were a real wonderful souvenir of um, the conference. And then the day ended with Bob and Dana, Bob Katz and Dana Richards, announcing the launch of the latest book from the BSI Press, My Scientific Methods, which I'm sure we'll be talking about you know, with them in future. And in the evening, there was a merchant's room and an opportunity to play games of whist, but also Henry Boot put on a wonderful program, a real show. He'd brought all of his equipment and really put on a magnificent uh, evening entertainment of songs that on the agenda was called the, The Day's Music Hall. But it was an encore of the presentation that, that uh, Henry gave, which I had missed 14 years ago when the BSI had a conference in Salt Lake City. And there was a cash bar there, and Henry was uh, just fabulous. And so that was the end of Saturday. Mm, superb. Superb. Mm. And Sunday was a shorter day. It opened uh, with a talk by Jim Webb about the might of empire. And he talked about the organization of the British Army, Navy, and other forces in 1895. Talked about the uniforms, the rank, the organization, how it changed. Absolutely fascinating review. West Point quality review 
and you referred to West Point quite frequently, um, of the various armed forces in those days. And then Jim was followed by uh, an all too rare opportunity uh, to hear John Linsenmeyer, a great irregular former editor of the Baker Street Journal, uh, John, whom I'd not seen in a number of years, talked about the five most important soldiers in the canon. And he talked uh, first about Watson, who, um, you know, is, is obviously someone whose military experience we owe the existence of his relationship with Sherlock Holmes in the canon. His second noted soldier in the canon was Murray, the orderly who rescued Watson and brought him to safety. His third was Major General Charles Gordon. And John had quite a lot to say about Charles Gordon. His father was also a major general. He went to Woolwich and um, the, the Woolwich Academy. And I wasn't aware of this, but there were two basic educational institutions available for people pursuing a career in the military. One was Sandhurst, uh, where cavalry officers uh, were educated, but the other was Woolwich, and uh, which was much more scientific and engineering. And Jonathan, <laughs> Jonathan, John, John said um, at Sandhurst, because this was obviously a more, at least the, in their view, a more sophisticated and intellectual educational institution in Sandhurst. They had a silly joke, John said, and that was his words, a silly joke. Did you hear about the cavalry officer who was so stupid that the others noticed? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give him that one. That's pretty good. Isn't that funny? That's pretty good, yeah. <laughs> and, and he talked about, really, Major General Charles Gordon, honest, uncorruptible, died less than a year after he arrived in Khartoum. And then he talked about the colonels in the canon, um, quite a list. He said, you know, don't, don't quote me here, so I'm, I shouldn't be quoting him. But he says, I've counted, I think, around 16. What a wide uh, universe of characters. But he singled out Colonel Ross, a decent, respectable colonel, the owner of Silver Blaze. And that left him with his fifth and final um, soldier in the canon. And John chose Colonel Sebastian Moran. Now, that happens to be John's investiture in the, in the Baker Street Irregulars. And I did not have an opportunity to talk to John, but I did have an opportunity to capture a few minutes of his closing audio about Colonel Moran. And he began by pointing out that we know, canonically, it's, it's in the canon, that Colonel Moran was not hanged and was found innocent of the murder of Ronald Adair because at a time after those events, Watson tells us that Colonel Moran is still out and about. And so that's where I've just sort of chosen this little track so that our listeners can hear a bit about, uh, a bit from John Linson Meyer, who's really worth hearing any time. Beyond the capability of an air gun, which could not in any event have fired the lethal projectile. It is obvious that Holmes himself viewed the murder case against the colonel as very shaky. <laughs> Watson reports that at the time of Moran's arrest, Holmes told the arresting officer, Lestrade, I do not propose to appear in any way in the matter at all. To you and you only belongs the credit <laughs> of the remarkable arrest. So there at long last, we have the exoneration of the heroic record of the canon's most distinguished soldier. One final word is necessary on the soldiers of the day. He is named nowhere in the canon, but he, along with his comrades in the Royal Navy, 
made the glories of high Victorian Britain possible. For his name, we go way back to 18, sorry, 1794, and one of the abortive uh, British invasions of North, Northwest Europe in Napoleon's wars. At one battle, Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Wellesley, commanding the 33rd Regiment of Foot, came upon a mortally wounded soldier who looked at him, up at him and said, it's all right, sir, it's all in a day's work. 20 years later, Field Marshal the Duke of Wellington, same guy, was asked by the War Office to come up with a name like the lawyer's John Doe for the typical British soldier to use in training manuals and that's the like. Remembering that brave private from years before, Wellington suggested his name, Thomas Atkins. And so Tommy was the archetypal British soldier for well over a century. Tommy had his own bard to sing his praises. Rudyard Kipling, who wrote, I went into a public house to get a pint of beer. The publican, he up and says, we serve no redcoats here. The girls behind the bar, they laughed and giggled for to die. So I out into the street again and to myself says I, oh, it's Tommy this and Tommy that and Tommy wait outside, but it's special train for Atkins when the trooper's on the tide. It's Tommy this and Tommy that and chuck him out the brute, but it's savior of his country when the guns begin to shoot. So here's a salute to the wounded soldier, the wounded surgeon, heroic orderly, Gordon Pasha, all the colonels in the cannon, and to Tommy Atkins, whose courage underlay it all. Thank you. Uh, how marvelous. I'm glad you were able to capture that. Yeah, it would have been lovely to talk to John, but being able to share his closing remarks from his talk. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, all of these will be brought together for people to read, but I thought the connection to Kipling was lovely. Yeah. Well, our goal here, you know, has been to present a picture of the conference without <laughs> without recreating something that is so long that it could be a conference. So I would just point <laughs> out, you know, sort of, sort of race to the close here, um, because you've really gotten a, a good flavor of what's going on here. Candy Lewis followed with a terrific presentation on the world of art and presented some fascinating paintings and illustrations that showed racing as an example and the appearance of British gentlemen in the Victorian era. Jay Ganguly did a terrific talk on the great Agra treasure and the canonical plundering of India, and I was really sorry not to be able to talk to her. Cliff Goldfarb talked about the Egyptian connection in Conan Doyle. He spent quite a time touring and, and uh, with his wife, Tui, in Egypt and had some fascinating examples of his communications back about what he was seeing in Egypt. And then on Sunday, Alex, Karen Wilson and Alex Katz put on a musical review. They did five or six wonderful numbers, including Harvey Officer, you know, there's this wonderful old song on the road to Baker Street, which the old irregular Harvey officer had written, and it's to the tune of On the Road to Mandalay. <laughs> and so it was a wonderful opportunity to hear Alex and Karen put that on and other things. Dana Cameron and Maria Fleischick talked about really the, the, uh, the disempowered women of the canon, uh, women, power, and empire in the canon and had a great perspective on that. Ira talked about the Privy Council in the canon. I, I bet you, well, I if someone had asked me where does the Privy Council 
appear in the canon, I would have said two things. What's that? And beats me. Do you know where the Privy Council appears in the canon? The Privy Council? Um, well, there's got to be uh, the Duke of Holderness with one of some of the uh, uh, initials after his name. I know PC was one of them. Which yes, is Privy you found Council. It. Yeah, you found it. You found. Say, you beat me. I was forgotten if I ever knew that. Ira talked about it with 500 members, but only three were a quorum. And the interesting thing mm. that I found, I found the whole paper fascinating. But the interesting thing was, you know, some people are called the Honorable, you know, Scott Monty, and some mm -hmm. people are called the Right Honorable Scott Monty. Huh. Well, if you're called the Right Honorable, it's because you're a member of the Privy Council. Oh, interesting. I always yeah. thought the Privy Council was the uh, guild uh, that you had to approach if you wanted the key to the men's room. <laughs> that is a great segue to the to the two closing things on the conference. One was Al and Betsy Rosenblatt. Every year at the Baker Street Irregulars Dinner in January on the Saturday at the cocktail party, Al and Betty gave, stand Betsy, up yeah. and give a Betsy give a wonderful um, verse. You know, it's a it's a terrific series of couplets about the activities of the prior year and what's happened, you know, in the Baker Street Irregulars weekend that year. And this is the first time they've done that for an event other than the January year-end dinner and cocktail party. And they gave a little recap of the year so far and of the conference, which was great. And then there was a panel discussion about the future of, the, uh, of our global community which was all around really very substantive discussions about diversity. What can we do to become more diverse, get more people involved, and so on? And Peter Blau closed that discussion by talking about what they do at the Red Circle, which, you know, basically to have the easiest possible attendance. If you want to come and not eat, fine, come. Um, you know, there's no entrance exam, no dues. And really is a is a sort of model of outreach. But we'll hear more about diversity, I'm sure, from Michael Keane and new audiences, you know, as the year continues. And that's it. And I closed by uh, talking to a um, relieved Ross Davies, who organized all this. My name is Ross Davies. I'm a Sherlockian. <laughs> I live in Washington, D.C., I spend lots of time, or as much time as I can, with Peter Blau's Red Circle crowd, uh, and as much time as I can with the ACD Society crowd, and many, many hours listening to trifles uh. on the air. I am really happy. I am, as I think any organizer of any event would be, relieved that we reached our home port safely and uh, without taking on too much water. People seem to be leaving smiling and chattering, which is generally a good sign at not just a Sherlockian event, but pretty much any event. Uh, and so now I'm going to go lie down in a quiet place. <laughs> uh, and you may not hear from me for a couple of days. Over the long run, uh, first of all, this was, uh, as a couple of people mentioned during the conference, this was a Mike Whalen, Marianne Bradley creation. And all the rest of us have done is implement their plan for the last year or so, there has been a small group of people who have met periodically to orchestrate everything, to try to make sure that the gears mesh. Uh, and that group is Michael Keane, Bob Katz, and Greg Ruby, and Randall Stock. Uh, and uh, it is really those two who conceived of this and got the, uh, got the, the ship launched. And then this half dozen have sort of cooperatively captained it uh, along the way. And then here at the event, We've had three official photographers who were working pretty much full time, it seemed. Again, Randall Stock, who if you look at the little dot, you know, colored dots that people have on their name tags at conferences, Randall could basically have a rainbow of those things on his. And then another photographer, uh, the BSI's uh, sort of chief photographer, Ben, ben Pazowski, uh, who was also a presenter, was a, another great support during the conference. And then Will Walsh was the third photographer. But in some ways, I think the uh, sort of the uh, maybe the best analogy is R2-D2 and C-3PO, you know, the two characters who uh, in concept were not supposed to be the stars but ended up being the stars were Heather Holloway and Crystal Knoll who were the timekeepers for the conference. 
uh, the, the most frequent compliment I've had over the course of the weekend is how incredible and awesome and nice it is that we stayed on schedule. Uh, by the end of the conference, people were referring to Heather and Crystal as the time cops. So uh, a special salute, I think, to Heather and Crystal. Don't mess with the time cops. <laughs> Doctor Who yeah. tell, tells us that. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, how wonderful that was. It gave, gave us a, a great taste of what it was like to be there, what we missed out on. Uh, and uh, I, I guess we can look forward to uh, the next quadrennial event, which uh, are, are they... Are they going back to the original timing, or are they sticking to four years hence? Oh, I have no idea. I have no idea. Stay tuned. One of the great Sherlockian periodicals is back, the 2021 Sherlock Holmes Review, edited by Steve Doyle, art direction by Mark Gagan, with all new contributions from Nicholas Meyer, Robert Doherty, Frank Cho, Anne Margaret Lewis, Steve Hawkinsmith, Les Klinger, Jimmy Aiken, and more. 118 pages about Sherlock Holmes. The illustrators, community, collecting, comics, reviews, film and TV, scholarship, including new artwork, Irene Adler drawn by the inimitable Frank Cho. It looks like a book and reads like a magazine. It's the Sherlock Holmes Review. Get your first edition copy of this essential 2021 Sherlockian annual, the all-new Sherlock Holmes Review at wessexpress.com. Oh, well, hey, guess what? If you have stuck it out for this long through the show, you've made it all this way, we have something special in store for you. That's right, it's Canonical Couplet, where we give you two lines of poetry, and you have to come up with the Sherlock Holmes story that it refers to. If you were around here the last time in episode 245, we gave you this clue. Watson knew the hunt was on, a wild beast in the night. Mrs. Hudson changed the figure just eight times to get it right. Bert, <laughs> do you know which story we're talking about? Yes, of course, that's the case. One of the first of the adventures, it's a case of the frozen salesman at the estate sale. That's the one Watson called the auctioneer's numb. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no. Uh, I think I'm numb after this many. Oh. Yeah. Oh, no. No. Well, you were, you were close. Not. It was, uh, <laughs> of course, of course it, well, let, let me let me let Eric Deckers uh, go for it here. Uh, he said, I've got it. This was the story that opened with the murder of Ronald Adair by Colonel Sebastian Moran, which was turned into a movie starring Robert De Niro and Christopher Walken. It's the Adair Hunter. <laughs> Wait, Ooh. that's that's not it. Ooh. That's not it. I'm thinking of the wrong story. He says, uh, this one is the adventure of the empty house. Yes, that oh. is right, Eric. That right is right. Again. And I think we had a record number of submissions this time. So uh, I actually need to expand the prize wheel. I built it out a little bit, and it took a little extra effort to wheel it into the office here. It barely cleared the <laughs> threshold of the door. Uh, but now that it's here, it's staying in the office, and uh, we'll turn to it now and give it a big spin. Let's go around. And here it lands on number 45. 45. And that corresponds to, uh, looks like Mike DeCoupery. 
Mike, congratulations. We will have some wonderful stuff from the IHO's vaults. Our friend Tony Katroki has been supplying us with uh, some wonderful books and other ephemera, so uh, we will stock that up and uh, get that out to you. So stay tuned. And now it's time for this episode's canonical couplet. Here we go. Losing two secretaries could put you off your feed. Losing the third, tis carelessness indeed. If you know the answer to this episode's canonical couplet, put it in an email, address the comment at IHearOfSherlock.com with canonical couplet in the subject line. If we choose you from all of the correct entries, you will win a prize. Good luck. And I should say that uh, we are very pleased to have a special prize related to this episode that our friend Ross Davies has generously agreed to donate. It is a a prize bag from the BSI Sherlock Holmes and the British Empire Conference. It was the the check-in bag that every attendee received. So, wonderful, wonderful thing there. And what's what's some of the stuff that's in it, Bert, since you got one? Oh, well, you'll get the agenda. You'll get but a wonderful version of the agenda that replicates how Conan Doyle sealed and uh, captured his manuscripts. So it's sort of a reproduction of a Conan Doyle manuscript in part. You'll get a deck of these commemorative playing cards, which are absolutely fabulous. And you'll get, I believe, there's a bookmark, a very large bookmark in there, and uh, some other things. I don't know if Ross has included some of the handouts. Probably has, it, uh, that were left over from the, um, the conference, but it should be. It's a real treat, and the bag is just lovely. Excellent. Well, what a great incentive to send in your answer to the canonical couplet. Well, I guess that just about does it for us here. We've said just about all there is we can say. Oh, so, thank goodness. Uh, this is the better left unsaid, Scott Monty. <laughs> and this is the quietly mumbling in the corner, Burt Walder. <laughs> and together we say, The, the Games, games of a Foot! foot. <laughs> The The games of foot. You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes.